Welcome to our second episode of Season 2 of Clock Conversations from Thrombosis Canada. I'm David Airdrie, Executive Director. And welcome to our co-hosts, Maha Othman from Queen's University in Kingston and Dr. Jamil Abdulrahman from Toronto General Hospital. We're excited to be back again. Welcome to both of you. Good morning. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. We're here to provide you with updates on diagnosis and management of thrombosis, featuring interviews with authors of recent research publications and highlights of education programs from Thrombosis Canada. Thank you for joining us for this episode. In this episode, we'll be discussing a recent paper pub published in Thrombosis Research entitled The Prevalent of Relevant Drug-Drug Interactions and Associated Clinical Outcomes in Patients with Cancer-Associated Thrombosis on Concurrent Anticoagulation and Anti-Cancer or Supportive Care Therapies. We are very pleased to have one of the co-authors uh, with us today, Dr. Su Fei Wong. Dr. Wong is a hematologist and an associate professor in the Division of Hematology Department of Medicine at the University of Ottawa and the Ottawa Hospital, and also an associate scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Her main areas of clinical and research interest include clinical research for the optimal prevention and treatment strategies for patients with cancer-associated thrombosis, drug-drug interactions with anticoagulants, and obesity-related thromboembolism. She has received research funding from the Canadian Institute of Health Research and Ottawa Hospital Academic Medical Organization. She was also a co-chair of the Hemostasis and Malignancy Subcommittee of the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis from 2018 to 2020. And thank you so much for participating in our podcast today, Dr. Wong. Um, thank you, Maha, and thank you, Jamel and David, uh, for having me. Very excited to discuss our paper today. Great. So to begin with, could you explain the major concern with drug-drug interactions between anticoagulants and other drugs, and specifically in the context of cancer? Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah. So, you know, we, we all know that cancer patients have a significant increased risk of thrombosis uh, and atrial fibrillation, and both of which the standard of therapy is anticoagulation. Uh, you know, in large uh, Danish cohort, uh, they really show that uh, cancer patients have 12 fold increased risk of uh, uh, VTE compared to non cancer patients, and the risk further increase if you give them an uh, anti cancer therapy to 23 fold. However, this pa cancer patient also has have increased risk by at least three to four, uh, five fold increased risk of bleeding uh, compared to non-cancer patients while in anticoagulation. And in addition to that, cancer patients also are often uh, commonly elderly. Uh, and as you can imagine, they often have um, uh, uh, organ dysfunction such as kidney or liver dis dysfunction. Uh, and they are also uh, often have polypharmacy. They, they often require a lot of different medications, uh, uh, not only for their cancer treatment, but also a slew of uh, supportive uh, cancer, supportive therapy um, for cancer uh, therapy. And then on top of that, they also have uh, uh, medication that is needed for their comorbidities, such as, you know, diabetes, hypertension, you, mean, you name it. So as you can imagine, the more uh, medication that we pile on, uh, really uh, just significantly increase uh, the potential risk of drug, drug interactions and potentially can lead to uh, uh, relevant clinical outcomes. Right. So if I can jump in and ask you kindly to clarify the difference between a pharmacokinetic drug-drug interaction and a pharmacodynamics drug-drug interactions, and how do these correlate with the clinical outcomes? Yeah, thank you. So it uh, turns out there are, you know, really uh, three main types of drug drug interaction, but the two main type is what you just mentioned, uh, Maha, when we uh, were uh, kind of discussing uh, related cancer and anticoagulation. So it's uh, mainly a PK, that's a pharmacokinetic, and then PD, the pharmacodynamic interaction. So uh, PK, pharmacokinetic, is probably what most people think about when, when drug drug interaction comes to your mind. It's particularly talking about when, you know, two or more drugs when you want to use them together, and they do share uh, common met uh, metabolism pathways, uh, which can 
can cause uh, alterations in drug absorption, distribution, metabolism, or excretion. Uh, and the prime example, what we talked about a lot with DOEG, is uh, that the DOEG is a um, metabolite of the SIP um, and PGP uh, pathway. So uh, if we want to use combined DOEG and especially strong SIP or PGP inhibitory inducer, there could be interaction that we have to consider. Uh, in the, uh, while uh, the, the second interaction, the PT interaction, pharmacodynamic uh, interaction, uh, that happens when there's enhancement of drug uh, effect uh, in the presence of other drugs. The prime example would be the concurrent use of anticoagulant and antiplatelet agents um, that can cause both cause bleeding concerns. So, uh, so you know, I, 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 I feel like a lot of times we talk a lot about PK uh, interactions, uh, but PD interaction is also uh, quite important, in which we'll discuss later in the context of our paper, which we identify PD interaction is probably uh, even more common than PK interaction. And really depending on the interaction, depending on it's a, you know, inducer inhibitor, uh, you know, causing increasing or, uh, or decreasing the drug concentration that can certainly cause different clinical outcomes. Okay, interesting. So let's move on to the study. Tell us about the kind of study you conducted to assess the drug-drug interactions between anticoagulants and cancer drugs. And who did you include in the study? Yeah, um, yeah. So we, uh, the, uh, based on the you know the the previous uh, premises that we just discussed, we uh, become interested in really looking at our own centers' data to see. Uh, really, ideas is to see you know is drug drug interaction, which has been talked uh, about quite a lot in, in major guidelines, is it really a concern, and what kind of concern, or how what's the degree of concern? So what we did is we performed a single center retrospective cohort study uh, in patients that managed. Uh, and seen by the thrombosis unit at the Ottawa Hospital. Um, we include cancer patients uh, with a diagnosis of acute BTE, uh, and they are treated with any uh, with endocoagulant, mainly long gaparin or DOEG of any kind of any kind. And uh, but they also have to be on any concurrent cancer therapy or supportive uh, care therapy. Uh, and we only include patients, our cohort cutoff is December 31st, 2020, um, because we want to follow the patient and have a sufficient uh, follow-up. Uh, we do follow all patients for six months or until death, if the death occurred prior to the six months time point. Um, and our primary outcome is really on the percentage of patients who have uh, endocoagulant-related drug interaction at any time during the six-month time period, uh, because it turns out even, you know, as simple as that, uh, we actually, you know, found very little data out there. Uh, and uh, we can discuss a little later, but how we define drug interaction is to use Lessic, uh, Lessicom, which is a, a large drug database uh, that's linked to our uh, medical, electronic medical records, and uh, we defined uh, the interaction risk of C, D, or X uh, by, you know, when it's defined by the lexicon to be, um, to be uh, in the uh, significant drug drug interaction. Thank you. Now you made us very curious to hear about the key findings regarding the presence of drug drug interactions in this study. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we, you know, after a, a few uh, kind of exclusion, uh, we eventually included a, a total of 667, uh, two, I'm sorry, 267 patients. Uh, and it's between, uh, in the patient that I treated between 2017 and 2020. And what we found is, is about, uh, 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 the, uh, our primary outcome is percentage. So we found about 41% of patients, who, which is 111 patients uh, who has any kind of drug drug interaction uh, is our definition, CD and X, uh, in the group, and another 156 uh, is in the no drug drug interaction group. Um, so our uh, mean age is about 63, and about 50% are female, and we really include uh, a whole variety of cancers, uh, and the majority of them, about 60%, has metastasis, uh, uh, have met uh, at the time of uh, inclusion, and a majority of them, about 92% of them, have ECOG performs level 0 
42. Um, so again, our uh, what we found is 41.6 percent, so about 41 percent had drug drug interaction uh, when they classify it by CD or X. Uh, interestingly, we also found really high risk of uh, interaction if we are not limited to anticoagulant, which is include all medication, including all the pain medication, all that. Then the majority, really 95 percent, uh, have drug, some sort of drug drug interaction. We did find the majority of cases are class C. So class C is uh, just to give you some definition is defined by significant clinical interaction and monitoring is recommended. Um, um, while class uh, drug class D uh, is interaction that therapy modifications re recommended, not just monitoring. So D is more kind of one step uh, level up of more interaction. And then the, the most severe interaction is uh, uh, drug X, which it uh, uh, recommended that is contraindicated to combine both drugs. Um, so, but we did find that the majority of interaction we identify is class C. There's only about 10% class D, and we did not identify any class X interaction interaction in our cohort. Uh, the mean duration of interaction with drug interaction uh, is about 60 days. So it's actually not long, but it's about two months. Uh, because as you can imagine, these cancer patients, they, they get on and off different medications all the time. So we do have, you know, uh, a record of the uh, start and stop day of anticoagulant medication to allow us to do this analysis. Uh, what we really found is, uh, in addition to the high risk of, uh, of drug drug interaction, the 41%, um, uh, the other thing is we also found both lumcaprin and DOEG have interaction, not just the DOEG. I think DOEG has been talked about a lot, um, but one uh, key finding we found is uh, we, could, we shouldn't forget about lumcaprin as well. And our main interacting drug is actually not anti-cancer therapy, which has been talked about a lot. We found the majority of interacting drugs are due to pharmacodynamic dynamic interaction. So many antiplated or uh, SSRIs or antidepressant medication, because these are cancer patients, all of them are on antidepressant and that's considered to have some platelet um, uh, inhibiting effect. Uh, we do find patients who are uh, prescribed DOEG uh, have additional interaction that's uh, from the PK interaction, the, the CIP and PGP. So people who are prescribed DOEG at any time during the study compared to long time group, uh, weight heparin group do have a higher risk of uh, significant higher risk of, uh, of theoretical drug drug interaction. Well, thank you for this comprehensive description of the study outcomes. I'm curious to ask you about the uh, different patient and cancer related factor in such a diverse cohort. Do you think these factors like age, sex, or type of cancer have affected some of the findings that you've seen? Yeah, um, yes, I totally agree that it's a very uh, yeah, important uh, uh, kind of note that, you know, we, we uh, know that age, uh, sex, and type of cancer and uh, type of uh, cancer therapy, there's a lot more confounders and factors that definitely would affect the outcome, uh, such as bleeding and, and thrombosis. Uh, I would say, though, even though I uh, uh, recognize that our cohort is modest in, in sample size, um, but we did carefully compare the baseline char characteristics of the two groups, the, the uh, drug drug interaction, no drug drug interaction group in our paper. Uh, where, and we did not uh, find uh, any uh, significant differences of the two groups to start with, except for two things, which is not too surprising. The one is uh, people who are in the drug drug interaction group uh, do tend to get started on DOEG more, um, which as we uh, just alluded to, and also people who are in the drug drug interaction group have more concurrent medication that uh, on average of four medication, 4.3 medication, this is in addition to anticoagulant as compared to a 3.4 uh, uh, concurrent medication uh, in the no DDI group. But, but all the other uh, kind of characteristics that we compare, including the age, uh, weight, uh, uh, gen uh, gender, cancer type, uh, cancer stage, and all that, uh, there's no signif significant differences. But this definitely will, uh, point is well taken. These are important risk factors to, to consider. Interesting. And how about uh, clinical outcomes? Uh, the study also looked at that. Could you tell us about the clinical outcomes of recurrent VTE, clinically relevant bleeding, mortality? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we, we believe that is very important uh, to uh, look at the clinical outcome. Uh, so because prior studies, when we review the literature, really are, uh, this is one of the area they're not, a lot of times they, they look at the interaction, but not, there's no correlation with clinical outcome. So we definitely look at the, uh, you know, standard uh, thrombosis, uh, clinical outcome from thrombosis study, including the recurrent VTE. 
uh, and the six month, and we calculate our cumulative instance of six months. Uh, we thought that this way we can also indirectly compare to the randomized control trial because most randomized randomized control trial in cancer related thrombosis use six months as as a kind of uh, the follow up period. So what we found is our recurrent uh, uh, risk uh, or six month cumulative instance of VTE is really consistent with their uh, with randomized control trial report is about eight point two percent with a ninety five percent confidence interval about five to eleven. Uh, we also uh, use the standard ISTH criteria uh, to look at major bleeding and clinically relevant non-major bleeding. We found our major, uh, uh, and then we combine those two to to say that that's a relevant. We believe those are relevant clinical bleeding. So the six months instance uh, of rel clinical relevant bleeding uh, is six point seven percent. Again, that's a combination of major and clinically relevant non-major bleeding. Uh, so major bleeding, if you break it down, major bleeding is about one point nine percent. Uh, and clinically relevant non major bleeding, 4.9%. We also collect data on minor bleeding, which doesn't fit either criteria. So if you include all of them, so all bleeding is about 9% in six months. Uh, our mortality rate is about 8.2%, a little on the low side, um, I would say compared to the, the uh, historical cohort. Um, and uh, we also uh, try to, so these are, you know, all the array I just quoted you are for the whole cohort. Of course, we did look at uh, different, uh, the rate, uh, these outcome rate uh, between the DDA versus no DDA group. And uh, the bottom line is we uh, we have details in the in the, in the the paper, but the bottom line is we actually did not find any significant difference of the clinical outcome between the two groups. Wonderful. Well, one thing that came to mind when we were reviewing uh, the paper is uh, how do these findings uh, compare to previous studies on drug-drug interactions with anticoagulants, again, in patients with cancer? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is a, a, a great question because we, uh, yeah, when we we're trying to, uh, you know, do the study, we also review the literature. Really what we found is there are some papers out there, some studies uh, trying to look at this, um, but it is, it, as much as I'm, I'm aware, aware of, uh, most of the study, or I would say almost all the studies are more focused on, they usually use different uh, data uh, database. So not just Lessicom, we, we, you know, just picked Lessicom because it's, you know, routinely used in our center but there are certainly other uh, large uh, pharmaceutical or from uh, or drug database out there that different group will pick differently. But a lot of times they, they basically just look at the use the database and say, oh, this is the percentage of uh, potential drug drug interaction. But then then they and then it stopped there. So uh, we, we believe that it's important to step uh, to uh, have one step forward uh, to look at how that percentage of how that drug drug interaction or theoretical drug drug interaction can correlate to important outcome because as clinician, uh, we are really more, you know, uh, interested in either bleeding or thrombosis outcome. Or not so much. I mean, uh, the reason we're interested in drug drug interactions is because they cause outcome, right? So uh, that's really the important thing that we we want to differentiate. Uh, the other, the pre previous study, at least what for uh, what I can find, uh, also. Uh, not particularly focused on endocoagulants. So a lot of times they look at all medication combined. Uh, then, uh, and also a lot of studies are more in the warfarin era, actually, um, and, and not really focused on cancer patients. So uh, they do, you know, a lot of times common on uh, warfarin, not surprisingly, uh, is the main uh, medication that causes drug drug interaction. But we believe that our study kind of adds the literature by focusing on getting cancer patients uh, and more with more uh, kind of recent in the coagulant use, including the DOEG, as well as correlating to the clinical outcomes. Hmm. Okay. And what are some of the limitations of the study? Uh, certainly, yes. Uh, you know, certainly our uh, uh, study have uh, limitations uh, that are worth to to, uh, to mention. Uh, first of all, again, it is a retrospective study, uh, so uh, we are limited by the uh, you know the the. The, the records uh, that's available to us. Certainly there could be uh, missing outcomes uh, that uh, either the patients that didn't come to our hospital, so we're not aware of it, or it's missing um, because of you know, during the data collection. Uh, it's single center, uh, so we do recognize that uh, we are a, a big thrombosis center, so uh, a lot of our uh, clinician might already, uh, you know, kind of have this uh, concern about DDI and, and um, kind of intentionally avoid uh, 
concurrent drugs if they are worried about DDI. Um, but I would say, though, despite that, if we say that's the, the case, despite that, we still identify very high risk, you know, more than 40 percent chance of DDI. So I can only imagine that, uh, you know, it might be even higher uh, out there. Uh, certainly, our sample size is not large; it's modest. So it resulted in some of our confidence interval is quite wide, uh, and so because of the small sample size, uh, we were not really able to uh, further uh, kind of dissect out really detailed uh, or detailed uh, or individual drug combinations, such as you know, for example, I think inducers uh, is a um, kind of main uh, knowledge gap in the literature. Uh, when we try to look at that, but unfortunately, I think. We only have five percent of our drug combination is inducers, so we were not able to kind of dissect those out. Uh, well, lastly, we also um, uh, use uh, there are certainly a lot of confounding, uh, as Maha was mentioning, that uh, that we try to look at them, but because of small sample size, you wouldn't be able to uh, kind of probably account for all the confounders. Um, and lastly, using Lasicom, I would admit that is probably a little arbitrary. Uh, there are certainly again uh, other good uh, or great. Uh, a drug a database out there, but we mainly use that to it because it's a very common one to, uh, that a lot of uh, centers will use, and it's the one that uh, used in our center. Thank you. Uh, well, that's fair. Uh, well, at the end of the set of questions, we would like you to probably give us the take home message from this uh, study and if you have any future plans in this field. Um, sure, thank you. Yeah, so I think the study uh, at least it teaches me uh, that or uh, kind of I, I feel like a few points uh, that show me is there is a high risk of drug interaction. I guess it maybe it's not that surprising, but there is a high risk, you know, again, in our uh, studies, at least 40 percent uh, with it, if we're just considering the coagulant. Uh, and also, I think importantly, uh, we focus a lot of on DOA when we talk about drug drug interaction. Uh, I do think that we, we should also pay attention to low mechanical happen, that it's not like a low happen is completely safe. There's a lot of particularly pharmacodynamic uh, uh, interaction with low caparin, uh, that, you know, including in a platelet agent in the depressant that we should probably should uh, pay a little bit more attention. However, despite that, I, I would also uh, uh, emphasize, though, although the percentage uh, of drug interaction by, you know, this um, uh, lexicon identification is high, uh, whether that truly uh, kind of correlates to you know, true clinical outcome like bleeding and thrombosis is not uh, direct, uh, so it's not uh, always uh, correcting to. Um, so in our uh, study, we didn't really find uh, a significant uh, correlation. However, again, we are, you know, uh, limiting in small sample size. So we, uh, you know, I, I certainly feel that there could be some uh, specific drug combinations that, uh, that could have increased risk of either bleeding or clotting that, that we should be concerned about. So we shouldn't, you know, uh, say a blanket statement saying, oh, drug drug interaction is not important anymore. I do think that each individual uh, uh, combination uh, requires some uh, in, uh, in individualized treatment and individualized consideration. Um, and uh, But I would say that Class C interaction, at least by uh, Lexicom so far, is probably okay. Uh, and uh, what we found is moderate interaction, you know, not the strong, the moderate interaction, the SIP and PGP is probably okay, but again, probably. So definitely we need more data. Uh, future, you know, kind of in the looking forward and what, what, what do we do next? I would say that, you know, as you can imagine, it will be probably be, be almost impossible uh, uh, or quite challenging to do a randomized control trial in drug drug interaction because you can't really randomize patient to drug drug interaction versus no drug drug interaction. So my uh, thinking is uh, probably to answer this question, we definitely need more data, particularly probably focus on some uh, uh, specific combination that have potential, have a strong risk. Uh, you know, for example, we haven't even talked about anti-seizure medication, right? With DOEG, we talked about that a lot. We changed patient to, to warfarin. There are some in, uh, prostate cancer agent like uh, epilutamide also have that a lot. And, you know, at least in our center, we co often change them to warfarin, but but as we all imagine that warfarin, it's, uh, you know, also have its own problem. So is it a really a right thing to do? I don't know. Um, I do think that in the future, maybe it's something like large 
database, like, you know, we have, uh, you know, provincial database, like in Ontario, ICES, uh, I know other provinces have those too, uh, to uh, really, uh, maybe that, that will provide a larger sample size, certainly have its own limitation, but uh, if we can uh, design a study to kind of, you know, look at those, uh, at least provide some data in more, more larger data set, uh, that might be a potential uh, a future direction. Um, and I do think that, you know, in the future study, I would certainly highly encourage to, uh, you know, make an effort to correlate to relevant cl clinical outcomes, not just looking at the potential interaction. I think that's important for us as clinicians. Okay, great. And is there anything we haven't discussed today that you would like to add? Um, I just want to say that, you know, as we discussed, there's certainly more studies are needed, needed and um, certainly I would love to collaborate if anybody have any interest or uh, any ideas. Uh, I think that would be very exciting to, to coll collaborate and work on this. Well, thank you, Dr. Wong, for sharing with us your expertise and details about the paper, which I'm sure everybody will find very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me and thank you for your time. It was great to uh, great to have you as part of uh, Plot Conversations for Season 2. And I want to thank our audience for listening to Clot Conversations from Thrombosis Canada. We welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions on the podcast. And if you have any recommendations for future podcasts, please send them to us at info at thrombosiscanada.ca. And please subscribe to this podcast so that you're notified about the release of new episodes and don't forget to check out our website for educational programs, clinical guides, and tools. Also, uh, please consider donating to Thrombosis Canada to support our ongoing efforts to reduce morbidity and mortality due to thrombosis. Great to have you all here, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Have a great day. Bye, everyone.